welcome everybody. This is a great turnout and some of our folks are still gathering upstairs and will join us as the evening goes on. I'm Brian Tokar and I'm with the Institute for Social Ecology, which as many of you know has been operating here in Marshfield and Plainfield and this immediate area uh, actually since the mid-1970s, founded by Dan Chodakoff, Marshfield resident, and uh, our mentor Murray Bookchin, uh, who used to live in Burlington. And we've been here in this space and out on these grounds this whole last week as part of an incredible collaboration with folks from Cooperation Jackson which if you're not familiar with it, you'll be hearing a lot more about it this evening. Uh, I think Cooperation Jackson is one of the most exciting and hopeful radical community development projects in the US, maybe in the world today. And we've been working with folks from Cooperation Jackson over the past year on a number of racial and environmental justice related projects and this event over the past eight days has really been the culmination of the first year of our work together. I'm going to start right in by giving a little bit of an overview of the current climate situation and some of what people around the world are doing about it. And then I'll pass it over to Sister Imani and Maddie and Katie from Cooperation Jackson, who will be telling us about some of their work then we'll hear from Grace Gershuni, who's also with the Institute for Social Ecology, and then finally Molly Wills, who's with the Grassroots Center right here in Marshfield, and also with Rural Vermont, which is an organization I hope many of you are familiar with. So that's the order of this evening, and we'll have hopefully plenty of time for questions and discussion. So again, welcome everybody. So I'm going to show some slides, and I'm going to try to go through them quickly and resist the temptation to go into a lot of detail about each one, because I only have 15 minutes. I always start with an overview of what the world looks like today. And this is um, how global temperature and regional temperatures have changed over a five-year period between 2014 and 2018 compared to the closing decades of the 19th century, before there was any discernible impact of climate change in the world, even though we know that emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases go back to uh, really the late 18th century. And the world is in a difficult spot, as we all know. Um, places in the Arctic have had days in the spring 30 degrees higher than anything previously known. And we know that these climate changes are associated with rapid increase. And we're now talking about just 1.1 degrees Celsius or a little under 2 degrees Fahrenheit of average global temperature change since the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, which were the culmination of a period of hundreds of thousands of years of relatively stable temperatures on Earth. There have been fluctuations and changes and the coming and going of ice ages, but there's been a lot of consistency and the trends over the last few decades exceed anything that has been uh, known here on Earth for maybe as long as a couple of million years. And the consequence of that are some of the catastrophic weather events that you all know about. And of course, what we mostly know about here in the US are phenomena like the fires in California. And this week, we've heard from people up in Chico, California, which is a direct neighbor of the town of Paradise, which we all know burned to the ground last year or the year before. So we know about wildfires in California, but we don't hear a lot about the effects in other parts of the world. Uh, massive, even more massive wildfires. In place, and this is from The Guardian just last year. Places like Australia, North Africa, South Asia. We read about the flooding happening currently 
in Kentucky, uh, the flooding that devastated the homes of people right in the city of St. Louis, including some close friends and comrades of ours who lost major archives of this movement going back many decades in those floods. But we don't hear as much about the flooding that's devastated places in Europe, in India, in the Middle East. Just in the last couple of weeks, the flooding in parts of Pakistan uh, has exceeded anything anybody uh, had imagined before, even though they're used to the cycle of monsoons in the summer. Uh, those cycles have become disrupted to the point where they get much more rain over a much more concentrated period of time, flooding places like the Indus River Valley where most of the population of Pakistan lives. This has led to an understanding around the world that we call climate justice. And the core take-home message of climate justice here illustrated in a study from McGill University from 10 years ago is that those people in the world who contribute the least to excess emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases will be and are already the most impacted by catastrophic climate events. This is a chart from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out just last summer. And it goes back and reviews data from the Berkeley Earth Project that documents that there are people in the world that have been observing significant climate impacts since before the 1980s, places in South America, in East Africa, in South Asia, where the kinds of extreme droughts and floods and wildfires that we're just beginning to experience here have been part of people's lives for decades. People throughout the global south were beginning to experience these effects during the 1980s, and you can see how it's since then spread north throughout the world. I'm going to say more in just a little bit about what people in various parts of the world are doing about this. But first, I want to say a little bit more specifically about where the excess emissions come from. This is from a UN Environmental Program report from a couple of years ago called the Emissions Gap Report. And the take home message, the richest 1% of the global population account for more emissions than the poorest 50%. Organizations like Oxfam have delved more deeply into this data. And here we can see that the poorest half of the world are responsible for half as much emissions as the richest 1%. The global middle class, the, the light green, has been growing over the last decade, but still only emit about half as much as the wealthiest 10%. So in the UN negotiations and other mainstream discussions of the climate crisis, we mostly read about the responsibility of various countries, which is a serious problem, but the specific responsibility of the wealthiest people and the wealthiest corporations in the world uh, is something we need to look much more closely at. There's a report a few years ago called the Carbon Majors Report that was able to identify 100 corporations that were responsible for more than half of total global industrial greenhouse gases since the Industrial Revolution and 71% of all emissions since 1988. And these are companies that we're all very familiar with. The top emitter, of course, being Saudi Aramco, the Saudi national oil company, followed by Chevron, Russian Gazprom, ExxonMobil, the national Iranian oil company, and then BP and Shell and several others. And one of the interesting things about uh, the findings of the carbon majors is only about half of the most responsible corporations are private fossil fuel companies, the other half are mostly huge state-owned 
fossil fuel companies like Saudi Aramco and Gazprom and a number of Chinese companies and the Mexican National Oil Company and, and several others. So in response to this, movements have emerged around the world that have embraced the message of climate justice. And I'll identify three main currents that have come together to create this synthesis of thinking and action that we call climate justice. Uh, the first and primary in many ways are a vast array of indigenous and other land-based people's movements around the world. This was an indigenous delegation protesting the UN climate conference that happened in Copenhagen way back in 2009, which is where the stage was set for the UN shifting away from mandatory emissions limits and toward this notion of countries making voluntary pledges to reduce their emissions. Unfortunately, the US diplomats who were at the forefront of that push were people like Barack Obama, who was president at the time, and his Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. The following year in Cancun, Mexico, La Via Campesina, which was here in Marshfield just a week and a half ago. We'll hear more about that from Mali. Amazing global movement of small farmers and people reclaiming identity as peasants, which used to be an epithet, and they're saying we're proud of it. Um, La Via Campesina led the demonstrations uh, the, the following year in Cancun, and this was in Paris in 2015. And this is a combined delegation of the Indigenous Environmental Network and folks from the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, which I know many of you who were here this week are, are very familiar with. And that kind of brings us to the next central thread of the climate justice, and, and of course, the indigenous uprising at Standing Rock. Uh, just a few years ago, which really brought together indigenous nations and supporters in a way uh, unlike anything we've seen before. The second major thread is, of course, the environmental justice movement, which has brought together mostly people from communities of color around the US and internationally, who we know are systematically, five more minutes, who we know are systematically uh, at the receiving end of the most serious consequences of environmental pollution. This is Richmond, California, which is an oil refinery town. And these folks have been fighting Chevron for decades. And in 2009 was really the first visible coming together of environmental justice activists under a climate justice theme. And this is just a few years later in Albany, New York, when a lot of us from all around the region went to Albany to support a community and to shut down the, the docks that have been polluting this community for decades, where um, train loads of oil from Canada uh, that's shipped down the western edge of Lake Champlain are offloaded onto barges to be sent down the Hudson River to New York and New Jersey and all of the cities uh, down in that region. And we heard about the kinds of health consequences that people in that community are exposed to on a daily basis, how it's affecting their kids, and we shut down the port for the day in solidarity with those communities. The next important current, and this is where the explicitly anti-capitalist dimension of the climate justice movement uh, really comes in. Uh, in some ways, these are continuing currents from the global justice movement that shut down the World Trade Organization in Seattle back in 1999 and confronted other major global financial institutions, organizations like Rising Tide that came out of some of those actions that uh, contributed this dimension of focusing on the systemic roots, on the causes of the problem. 
uh, and brought that to the center of the movement. This was actually in 2014, the day after the huge climate march in New York City, which I know many of you were at. Thousands of us gathered to shut down Broadway in the vicinity of Wall Street, bringing the issues right to the center, right to the source of the problem. And one of the slow key slogans uh, embraced by the climate justice movement, and this is a demonstration in Italy just a couple of years ago, is the call for system change, not climate change. Of course, we also embrace a wide spectrum of alternatives. In social ecology, we've been saying for many decades that a movement that is going to thrive for the long run needs to bring together the oppositional current and the reconstructive, the alternative building current. This is a community garden in Detroit. We had a delegation from Detroit here for the week that just left this afternoon. And there are whole blocks that have gone vacant with the shrinkage of employment in the automobile industry. And people in Detroit have been seizing land and building farms. This is West Harlem. Folks from WE Act, uh, West Harlem Environmental Action which is an organization that has been doing leading edge work fighting pollution in their neighborhood. But also, uh, just a few years ago, they had a project to bring solar energy to public housing in West Harlem and train local youth to install solar energy uh, in their neighborhood. And this is an example of the no idea of energy democracy, which is another core theme of this movement. Emissions are still rising. We know they need to come down very rapidly for life on Earth to continue to be livable, for all species to continue to thrive. We know that current policies only get us into the 2.5 to 2.9 degrees Celsius range. And remember, a Fahrenheit degree uh, a Celsius degree represents two Fahrenheit degrees, approximately. So um, we're at 1.1 now. We're seeing the consequences. We know that between 1.5 and the official diplomatic goal of two degrees, the consequences get even more severe, and current policies bring us here. We've made some progress. Back at the time of the Paris Agreement, we were told by climate scientists that we could easily get into the four to six degree range by 2100. We've maybe fended off that possibility, although the current rush for oil uh, resulting from the war in Ukraine and other uh, global uh, situations uh, is beginning to threaten that progress. But um, we have a long way to go. We also know that the compromised climate bill that we've been reading about here in the US over the last several days between Senator Manchin, who's the most fossil fuel dependent uh, person probably in the US Congress in terms of who funds his campaigns and uh, his political activities generally. Um, every day, more news comes out about the degree of compromises and sellouts to the fossil fuel industry in that so-called compromise bill. And if people are interested, I can get a lot more into that in the discussion. I've been collecting material about that. To wrap things up, you probably can't read that chart, and it'd probably take me another 15 minutes to, to describe it. But there's a whole host of people, of things that people can do and are doing at the local level to begin to address the crisis and to address the fundamental inadequacy and incapacity of institutions at the national level to begin to do what needs to be done. Um, there are alliances of mayors that have pledged more 
uh, forward-looking climate policies. There's a fearless cities movement of municipal activists that are uh, taking power in cities like Barcelona and Spain. There are direct actions to halt new fossil fuel infrastructure. For example, folks in West Virginia who've been doing actions for years and thought they had beaten the Mountain Valley Pipeline from West Virginia to Virginia, which the Mansion Bill goes out of its way to expedite and to uh, mandate the, the completion of. A uh, trend toward remunicipalization of public services. During the neoliberal era, we had a huge push toward privatization. And uh, people in countries around the world are beginning to counter that, along with grassroots campaigns for energy democracy, like the one in Harlem. Local actions can be a catalyst for policies on a broader level when the demand is strong enough, when our movements are strong enough. Um, here in the U.S. we see that with minimum wage increases, campaigns for sanctuary for threatened immigrants, and efforts like that that have grown to have an impact at the national level. And we also need to keep in mind that even the environmental laws that we take for granted in this country that go back to the 1970s were a product of intense grassroots mobilization to the point where the powers that be decided that they would rather have the federal government implement a uniform set of environmental laws on the national level than having to keep fending off increasingly stringent laws and more aggressive lawsuits that these corporations were facing um, all around the country. That's what it takes to get a critical mass to move things on a national level, is pressure from below. And a host of movements for municipal power around the world that we continue to be inspired by uh, the notion from the anthropologist Arturo Escobar of radiating out institutions and practices of horizontalism and municipal power rather than trying to uh, grow a movement and, and scale it up in a conventional sense. And ultimately what we need is a global movement of movements that can challenge these institutions responsible for emissions and make it possible to usher the way toward a fundamentally different kind of world, a different social and economic system than the one that we all grew up in and have come to take for granted, and that allows us to liberate ourselves, liberate the earth, and really be, usher in a fundamentally different way of life. Thank you. So I want to introduce Sister Imani and Katie and Maddie from Cooperation Jackson, and we'll hear from them next. Good evening. Thank you. Hello. My name is Sissi Imani Olugmala. I'm with um, Cooperation Jackson, and I func function as um, the manager of the Freedom Farms in Jackson, Mississippi. Well, Cooperation Jackson was, was created to address the specific needs of people in the black and brown community that we serve. And downtown Jackson, um, the, the area is, um, how can I say it? There's a lot of economic blight in the neighborhood, but more importantly, what we notice in that neighborhood is that we do not have a grocery store there. Now, there's one probably six or seven miles from where we are stationed, but then you, you, that, that is not good for the people who have to go to the grocery store who may not have transportation to get there. So, and, and then the, what was there when, um, it, it, at Cooperation Jackson was a, uh, a plaza which, we, which we, we purchased, and it had, it used to have a Jackson Cash and Carry in it and the dollar store. Now that's the, both of those have long since gone, and also here recently, the uh, corner store about a block and a half away is gone. So that means that there's there's no way for people in that area to get food. Not only just get food, but get quality food. Because what I often say is, um, what I see in the in the in the neighborhood grocery stores is basically compost, 
And I say that because, because the grocers in our neighborhoods are not able to get good quality food, and if they were to, um, it would be too high for the people who need the food to get it. I'm, I'm speaking of organic uh, products, again, organic fruits and vegetables. So what we do here at the Freedom Farms is we address those issues, and we have um, approximately three um, plots of land that, we're going to, that we are using, two of which I know now, um, to grow wholesome, good, natural food. We can't use the organic moniker because there are some things we need to do in order to qualify for that. So we do what we naturally do is we get the seeds ourselves. We plant them in the ground and understand that they are not, they are not uh, sprayed with herbicides or pesticides. So that means there's a lot of physical work that needs to be done to bring forth this food that we all need to eat. Now we, we, we grow those things that we know the community, community will eat so, and also so that we can go to market and, and possibly sell. But also the other arm of that is not just having the food but also using food as medicine. So we have another herb, uh, herb portion, portion of that. Um, an herb garden and attached to that is another uh, organization that I'm forming of holistic health healers and practitioners to help heal the community. Now what, what this is, what, the reason why this is necessary because you know in black and brown communities we may not necessarily have access to health care and, and it cannot, we cannot afford it. So if we use food as, as medicine that would help. Um, Currently, uh, how can I say? Currently, <laughs> we're in a, the, the beautiful. The beautiful thing about um, the farm is that we can we can grow 365 days a year. So when I get back, I'll be preparing for my winter garden here soon. But the problem is this: I've noticed over the past three years, the climate changing so significantly that some of my crops have actually burnt up. Now, you know it's bad when your strawberries burn up. I had two, two strawberry pyramids, and I found that, that I have to tint them in order for them to grow right. Even some, some of my normal crops, I would have to do that if I want to see uh, uh, the produce to come and be available for, for the public. I've noticed that. I've noticed the absence of uh, uh, um, insects, special insects, because now we have an issue with insects not coming to do, be our pollinators, and uh, that makes it also very difficult, and, and it, it speaks to the quality of plants that we, that we grow. <laughs> but um, we are now trying to, to work on um, make, making sure that we have good, good soil, and, and making sure that we use, that we compost wisely and effectively to make sure that we have what we need in order to, to, to grow every year. Um, and, and, you know, it, it takes much. It takes money to grow, a, you know, to, to run a farm. So we're trying to find more economical ways in order to do that. And we're coming from our own resources. In fact, we're asking members of the community to come and, and give us their compost that we can use so that we can put it back into the farm. Also, we're asking to have them, that there, there be some equity there. If you come, some work ec equity, will you come in? And if you help us with the farm, of course, you get whatever the harvest is coming this year. Um, the most, one, of the, one of the more difficult things in my community that I find is that there's a stigmatism um, attached to working on a farm because of slavery. And some people don't want to do it. We have master gardeners in our community. But they don't feel, they don't want to come and do it. And that's not good. And it's not good for the children because the children don't know where their food comes from. And they don't know how to provide for themselves should anything untoward happens to the, happens to the point where we just literally can't go to the grocery store. So part of what we're doing as well and we're including in the process is um, teaching the youth where the food comes from and actually having them plant themselves. So um, I'm, I'm looking at um, I'm looking at co of, of creating a um, either an herbal or uh, uh, herbal amphitheater that you can actually go down into and actually plant. This is basically for the children, but also this is where I'm going to hold my the herbs, and they'll understand what it is to grow food, how food grows, what the plant actually looks like, what it needs. 
and, um, and, and even having a little exercise for them to understand what is food and what is not. And because uh, we do everything by hand, we, we pick the weeds by hand, what it also trains the, the, the person who's back there and or even assisting us is they know the difference between the food and the difference between non-food. Now, those, that non-food may be weeds or, or, or medicine, but, but for in all intrinsic purposes, we don't need that because we don't need it in their growing areas because we're trying to grow the food. And, and sometimes weeds can be, those other plants can be beneficial and some of them are not. So um, we, we are teaching people how to do that. I've gone in people's homes, set up their own gardens because that's also part of what we do. Go into their houses and set up their own gardens so they can do, so they can grow their own food and, uh, and, and not worry about not having what they need and just growing their own herbs and find out how, how to use them, how to, how to make tinctures and such as that um, and teas for them. Um, basically, basically that's it <laughs> for now. But, um, but, we, uh, but, but the wonderful thing too about Cooperation Jackson is we have three, for now, uh, actually four, LLCs. One is the Freedom Farm, which, is, uh, which I'm the manager of. The other is um, Zero Waste, mm -hmm. which Katie's going to speak on, and re Zero Waste and Recycling. Mm -hmm. We have one, a landscaping co-op, and we also have a community production center. Now, the function of the community production center is actually to uh, produce materials for housing and also electronic or, um, or, or tech needs. Um, the, the gentleman who was on earlier today, for those of you who were not here for that, Blair, he is uh, one of the, um, the people, one of the mentors helping um, members of the CPC work on the Fab Lab that they have there. And I think it's the first black-owned Fab Lab in the southeastern region. And they're doing very well. They're, they're, you know, I'm pr very proud of what they're doing, and um, it, it will be beneficial when we begin to build eco housing and so on the properties that, that uh, CJ owns. And having land is very important for more than one reason, because in the area that we are, and this is speaking to the CLT, in the area we are, as I said before, we have some economic blight going on. So that means we have some. Um, we have some houses that are abandoned in that neighborhood. So and the, the, the good thing is that we see that there needs to be housing and that we need to, 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 to acquire land to put people in. If we do not, then that means uh, businesses will come in and crowd people out so that humans can exist on the land and, and, uh, and have a place to live. So that's part of one of the initiatives of uh, Cooperation Jackson is to do that and make sure that we have safe housing because, of course, those housing that's in the, in the community are, are very old homes. So you're dealing with lead-based lead -based, um, paint and all of that that exists in the community, and then I have to come back in some of the areas and, you, and, and, and plant down in certain, areas, certain, certain plots to, to provide food. And this would serve as, um, and one plot I have is serving as a community garden. That means they're on schedule to allow the, the, uh, the community to come and get what they need up to a point, and then I go in and get what I need in order to, to go to market so that we can continue our cycle of doing what we need to do in terms of planting and harvesting. Um, for now, this is that. Um, as the zero waste anchor, um, Maddie and I's relationship, Maddie's my daughter, my husband's my co-anchor, I don't know why I'm pointing at you, <laughs> um, and so first off I want to say just a, a, a general, <laughs> a general point and that is um, at Cooperation Jackson I think we all believe that Pushing and trying to change policy has to be part of the picture, but that none of us should be waiting. So it needs to be both and. We need to be moving forward on um, all fronts. And to that end, Jackson doesn't have any recycling or composting going on in any way. There's a uh, guy who picks up for about $70 a month to a little piece of the town 
So we're trying to really open up the idea of recycling and also sorting it into uh, material that we can then melt, you know, make, it, make new things out of in coordination with the Community Production Center. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing that's not the same model as just shipping it out, right? We're trying to be intentional and integrate it somehow, uh, the, the trash. And then for the composting, we're just working to raise the community's awareness of the need to compost. We're going to offer that people, that we can go to people's house and help them set up. We're going to have a couple of spots where people can drop it off at no cost, but then some people obviously will be picking it up and, and sorting that. And if you, well, you guys up here in Vermont are so good with composting, so y'all totally get it. But the rest of the South, or the, the whole South, doesn't seem to get it. Um, so in that way, it's kind of challenging because in Mississippi, well, in Jackson, we've had 60 boil water notices this year. So people are not thinking about <laughs> their trash. It's not high on their priority list. And there's a lot of plastic coming through. So that just speaks to the need for this as a co-op. Um, and it also facilitates Sister Imani with Freedom Farm. And then another co-op that we have is called Green Team. And they do uh, yard stuff. And so we've got all the ingredients to make great soil. Um, and so that's something we're, we're working on. Um, I also just want to briefly talk about some of the other things that we're trying to do in, in, in general. Like Sister Imani mentioned, the CLT, that's the Community Land Trust. And the idea there is to get speculative pro uh, property off the market and lock it in to secure land to people who have otherwise been forced out of land. And we've got a lot of properties. Sister Monty also mentioned that the city is suffering from some severe neglect and some infrastructure issues. So the majority of the properties need a whole lot of work, or either they're just vacant properties that at one time had a house and now they don't. Um, which lends to a good opportunity for CJ, which is part of Polly's and the whole vision at Co-op Jackson is that <clears throat> these areas do have a lot of land. So there is a lot of potential, even though it's in the city of Jackson. You know, The other thing about CLTs is that we have to be thinking about that up here, because our land is going to be you know, r quickly running underwater. There's a lot of uh, water issues, even in the city. I mentioned the fact that we have boil water notices, but there's even sewage issues, and all that has to do with just the ground, right? That um, we're just not high enough above that sea level. Um, I want to briefly talk about something <coughs> that we discussed this week at our Building Ecosocialism from Below. That's the name of the conference that um, Brian mentioned. <coughs> the, um, I'm sorry, I need water. Can you just hang on top for a minute? <laughs> I have a bottle. <coughs> so I don't know where she was going exactly with me. <laughs> but something I can speak to at, um, in Jackson is uh, well, our climate situation, it's been hot as hell for years. So it gets worse every year. And the climate is all the other. Um, Temperature records seem to correlate with crime records as well, just because, you know, when you're hot and poor and have nothing to do, crime is one of the only options. <laughs> and often, people are in a state of survival because, you know, having no money um, in this society kind of leaves you left with um, nothing and no one to take care of you, no family, and it's really sad. <laughs> That's why um, I think Cooperation Jackson, one of our main goals is to be able to take care of and support this area so that we can bring ourselves up because we do have a lot of power. Um, agriculture has always been huge in the South and especially in Mississippi. Um, like Sister Money spoke on earlier, slavery, we've, I don't think we've evolved too much from that point because if you look at who is living well in Mississippi and who's living in shacks and don't get shoes and aren't in um, climate controlled buildings, which is like torture living in the South, are usually black and brown people. 
while you have a select few, we actually have the most millionaires per capita in Mississippi. So in a certain area, there is a lot of money, but it's not in the hands of black and brown people who are the majority of the folks in the South. So, you want me to take ready? it? If you want, you can uh, keep going. Okay, go, talk about building science. Um, no, I can't talk about um, so that brings me to an economy around um, care and mutual aid and bringing people together and um, just depending on each other because we can't depend on the state, especially us being black people in the South. The state holds all of these legacies of a system that was built on our oppression and our direct exploitation. So, and we have barely evolved from that, like I was speaking on earlier. Um, I like to call Mississippi a plantation state and there are lots of plantation states left over where, like I said, you look at a working class, it's often black and brown, serving the um, class above them, which would be you know, rich white folks whose granddad had all this money and land, and they're still profiting off of this and still living well while there are others not living at a standard I don't think anyone deserves to be living at. I don't think people deserve to be dying from heat exhaustion in their homes and um, wondering how they're gonna keep their children cool because there are no open like pools and things like that you have to pay because they're very selfish out here. Like, I don't know. The resources are limited for people. Um, I have many ideas on how we could kind of come together and be more intentional with the way we move and build and create buildings that are more sustainable for um, this climate crisis like earthen works and things like that and not just traditional wooden uh, you know, with all the chemicals and structures like that. But um, yeah, I think you want to talk a little bit. Do you, you want me to? Or do you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so there is one thing that Cooperation Jackson is part of, which is the Gulf South for a Green New Deal. I encourage everybody to check them out. They're trying to sort of, um, which Co-op Jackson's been delegates on that, I think mm -hmm. almost as long as they've been around. And they've, they've birthed a couple of other groups. One's called It Takes Roots. <clears throat> um, but the idea there is that all this money is coming supposedly for the environment, so let's make sure it gets to brown and local people's hands, indigenous people and black people's hands, right? Um, but I think all of us really need to be mindful of this biggering, biggering concept. Um, <clears throat> because wind and solar are not going to do this for us. They're not going to solve the situation. The mining industry itself said they're up to 26% of the emissions come from them. So if we think, and we being us green people in this room, that wind and solar are the solution, then we've got to reevaluate the way we're thinking. I want to bring up a concept called degrowth, which is something we discussed this week. Um, obviously, I'm saying that with sensitivity to those many, many communities in the world that this does not speak to because they don't have the ridiculous luxuries that we've got here. But I'm talking specifically to those <clears throat> of us in a, in a place like America where it's very easy to buy a new soda or a new hat or a new jacket or a new anything all the time. So I'll take this moment to remind everyone to secondhand purchase as much as you can, uh, gift economy as much as we can because actually when we partake in the marketplace, we consent to this whole system of exploitation. exploitation. Um, so I'm gonna not, I really wanna drive home the idea that we just have to change the paradigm because we can't keep living this, this system of, of just consume, consume, right? The planet has limited resources. So we've gotta keep all that uh, conscious in our minds. And then also that, well they call that sometimes false solutions, if you've heard people talk about that. But the people who talk about it the most are the greenwashing capitalists. So just be mindful of these little pitfalls that are not really solutions. Um, another thing I want to speak to is the use of pesticides and herbicides. We talked this week about 
uh, men needing to speak up when they say, see women being oppressed, um, trans, cis people need to stand up for trans people when they see it, and white people need to stand up for everyone they see being oppressed. Um, humans need to stand up for the dirt and the water and the plants and the animals. Um, but we also need to stand up to the chemical companies. <clears throat> the soil is terrible in Jackson, and part of it is the pesticide use. It's all over the place. <coughs> I'm going to try to keep it together. Um, another issue just in regard to pesticides is that you really can't trust manure anymore unless you know where it came from because there's Grazon and many other chemicals that they put out there to make sure only grass grows and that shit, sorry, stays in the ground for four years. So no one's going to stand up to them but us, so I just rally us on that. Um, also, I, I would propose that we all look into this uh, building eco-socialism from below concept of build and fight. And I'm hoping that maybe the room can help me come up with those. I know them, but does anyone here know what are the ideas on the build and fight? Food sovereignty. Yeah, right on. Food sovereignty. Anybody else got one? Gift economy, right on. Anybody else? Public banking. Public banking is a good, very good step towards a just transition, I believe. And cooperative businesses. And cooperative businesses. Mm -hmm. Disregarding the concept of the ethical team. Say that one more time. Disregarding the concept or undermining the concept of the ethical team, which is the age of the human. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm, mm. Yes. Okay. Affordable green housing. Yes, affordable green housing for sure. I'm going to be real specific though. I'm talking specifically about the build and fight. Um, plan. I will tell him about it. Uh, Kali Akanu, I believe he's, 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 this is his thing. Do I need to move on or should I keep going? Perfect. Okay. So all those things you all said are terrific, but specifically I'm talking these five, is it five or six? I think it's five. <laughs> It's mutual aid. You understand mutual aid and how that would impact, right, all of this. Solidarity economy, food sovereignty, community production, and self-defense. <clears throat> if we focus on those things in that order, I think I'm missing one. Cooperative uh, businesses, I believe, is the mm -hmm. missing one. If we focus on these, that helps us stay on track for a more sustainable, ecological future. Um, and that's it. That's all I have. Thanks. Um, before we get out of here, I just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, in the South, I think something that could really help us, our entire um, kind of cultural climate, is um, empowerment because I would like to speak about in the South, the church, um, the influence it plays in people's lives can often just take the power from the individual. And I think that is kind of what you wonder, like why would a group of people let themselves be exploited to this level? Like you see people who are in a constant state of stress or something like that, but I honestly don't, I think it has to do with the church stepping in and kind of taking you, your power and telling you you have to come through me to feel this most natural human right, which is to connect with the world around you. And, and there, well, for me, God, God is everything, and God is in all and over all and through all, and we're all one. 
That's the truth. But anyway, people in the South, you say that and they're like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but, um, right. So I think as we evolve and take care of each other, we need to empower each other and love each other and meet each other where we're at and try not to come with judgment if we see people, you know, throwing their food in the garbage can instead of the compost or, you know, things like that that we think like, you know, the world is burning. But lots of folks, their world is burning and has been burning every day and they're trying to get out of it. So I just think we got to come and love everybody. Love all you guys. Thanks for being here. So yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> Okay, so I'm Grace Gershuni. I know an awful lot of you here, and I'm happy to be out in public and, and seeing your faces, even though they're half covered. Um, so I'm talking about the things that are real, some of the real solutions, and we've heard a little bit about that, and, and what Cooperation Jackson is doing is a big part of it. Um, I've come up through the organic movement, through organizations like NOFA, and through uh, working on trying to make organic a mainstream um, idea and uh, acceptable and spread it around to even the, the, the people who want to make money on it, which you know, that's the way things get taken up in this culture, and we need more acres under organic management in order to fight climate change, in order to adapt, in, in order to bring along food sovereignty as a concept. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of uh, the, the history and, and connection of how this movement came about and what it has evolved into, and, and it's all still evolving. We're all still evolving with it. Um, and as many of you know, my own history includes having helped develop the National Organic Program to, um, to give the official seal of or allowing people to use the term organic. And I want to tell you, Sister Imani, you can use that word. <laughs> you, just because I said so. Yeah. yeah. So this is a graphic I often use. Uh, it came from, a, from an academic named George Cooper. And um, what I would say is that there's a, you know, there's a long history of Europeans, colonialists, uh, white guys who have brought the, these concepts to the Western world, the, the world of um, the US and Europe in particular, and the ideas have been uh, popularized because of the potential for people to earn a living growing food. Um, and it has spread because of that. It isn't a perfect, <laughs> perfectly, uh, perfectly good system. It's still within a system of oppression that we all live in. And some people are bringing it to, uh, to higher and higher levels in terms of being uh, adapted to the, the uh, decentralist movement and our organizations around here NOFA, for example, have been very uh, in the forefront of the local food for local movement, local markets uh, uh, movement, and started a lot of the farmers markets around here. Um, and similar movements around the country have also been part of the organic movement. Um, but one of the things that is a glaring omission from this schematic is where did all of these ideas come from originally? Anybody have some idea about who, who really invented these very ecologically sound practices that 
have fed people through millennia. Yes. Indigenous farmers, indigenous communities. So those are really where all of this has come from. And uh, whatever the indigenous uh, heritage, and in Europe it was the indigenous uh, population there that inspired the biodynamic movement and inspired Rudolf Steiner to begin that. So uh, at any rate, there are a number of other terms that have become probably more meaningful in terms of where we need to go. And that's things like agroecology, which really emphasizes more of the social dynamic and the political dynamic of what, um, at what kind of agriculture we need to be doing on a community scale. Um, and uh, Molly is going to talk more about the agroecology experience and working with La Via Campesina and what that's all about. Um, regenerative agriculture has become more and more of a thing that is considered beyond organic, but real organic is regenerative. And that's about all I'm going to, uh, to say about that, except that the, the roots, the political roots and the tributaries that have contributed to bringing the organic movement and the whole concept of those ideas mainstream have some different and contradictory political roots. Um, and in fact, the, the European organic movement really started out with some extremely um, colonialist and in fact fascist sympathizers being some of the founders of these movements. Um, but there also have been people um, like um, uh, the Nearings in, uh, in the US and other uh, socialist inspired folks. And I've written about some of these roots in my latest book, which um, is available on, on the back table to look at. And there's a copy in the library. It's called Organic Revolutionary a memoir of the movement for real food, planetary healing, and human liberation. And a lot of it talks about uh, my experience with social ecology, as well as with uh, the organic movement. So these are some of the reasons why uh, organic, even if it's industrial organic, even if it's uh, just barely meeting the standards uh, will, in fact, address some of the problems, uh, the environmental problems that are causing uh, climate chaos. And first and foremost is the elimination of toxic biocides, which Sister Imani talked about and, and you all are very aware of. And all of those things kill soil life. And soil life, the soil carbon sponge that we talk about in the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition all the time is where things begin to change and where not just better crops and healthier soil, but more carbon is sequestered and more uh, fungal networks are built up, and the fungi are really where it's at. We're learning more and more about the importance of the soil mycelial system and the mycorrhizal fungi that actually form a sort of mutual aid network in the soil, where they actually bring the nutrients that are needed by the plant roots at the time that they're needed. It may be nutrients, it might be water, they have very complex systems of signaling when, what's needed where, and uh, in return they receive the carbohydrates, the carbon from the, that the plants have been manufacturing, pulling out of the air, and store it in their bodies, and when they die and decompose, 
it stays in the soil for different periods of time, etc. The other thing that um, organic agriculture universally prohibits is the use of synthetic nitrogen, which is one of the biggest contributors to the climate footprint of the food system in general. Um, this, the manufacture of nitrogen requires huge amounts of, of fossil fuel energy at this point, around three or three to five percent, I, I have heard, uh, of the world's use of natural gas is devoted to the manufacture of synthetic nitrogen. Uh, the other thing is that people have to do things like cover cropping, promote biodiversity, um, and maintain or improve the natural resources of their operation which means primarily soil quality, soil health, and water quality, biodiversity are all important. Biodiversity is another very um, important part of combating climate chaos. Uh, part of our understanding is that actually the, the, the homogenization of the biosphere, monocropping, monoculture, large plantations of a single crop are really detrimental to the ability of the earth to protect itself from losing the carbon from the soil, from losing the nutrients from the soil, from keeping all the cycles going. It's all about cycles. It's not just kind of a food chain. Um, Livestock contact with the soil is another important principle of maintaining soil health and one of the primary uh, ways of the reversing desertification, which is most of the, the earth uh, other than in humid northeast places like this where we get regular rainfall, is the idea of holistic plan grazing or management intensive grazing, uh, ways that livestock actually build soil uh, through managed grazing practices. Um, this is kind of controversial with some folks who believe that animals shouldn't be managed for agriculture, but that is, uh, has been a traditional and indigenous practice for many years. Five minutes, thank you. So the interrelated um, nature of our crisis also offers interrelated solutions. And uh, this means that we need to not just do one thing, and we can do different things in different places, and it's all about biodiversity. So what I have talked about is the idea of using biomimicry in social organizations, that we have to build the social mycelium. This is another thing we talk about in the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. So we, we talked more about that this week, um, and we talked a lot about building movements and how we keep our movements helping each other to evolve and to, to spread. And that is through forming mycelial networks that help each other and that help each other organically, not like some kind of computer network that we've plugged into. So I like that metaphor a lot better. So I'm just gonna go on and just say a few things that I learned in the past week from some amazing people who have who gathered here. Um, and I, I will leave it to Molly to talk about the agroecology encounter that happened in Marshfield, uh, uh, was it two, oh, only a, a week ago now? <laughs> it like, feels like a lot has happened in that last week. But we also heard from Miguel Angel Nunez in Venezuela via Zoom who talked about how Venezuela is feeding itself that 82% of the food and, uh, that they use, that they consume there is now being grown 
in these small polycultural uh, peasant farms that, that are called kunukos, which I had not heard that phrase before. I thought that was really a, a new one for me. And 60% of it, 60 of it is agroecologically grown. Um, then we had, uh, is Mel still here? Mel Figueroa was incredibly inspiring to, uh, to talk about uh, the, the incredible importance of connecting to the land in a particular place, learning the land, becoming native to this place is what we need to do as all of us being colonizers in one way or another, whether willingly or not. Um, and the importance of the wisdom of traditional ecological knowledge. And um, I have also been uh, very inspired by this uh, book by Liz Carlisle as an editor um, and talking about the, the stories of people who are really doing scientifically valid, well-supported work bringing in their ancestral knowledge and teaching from their own heritage to modern production of food and fiber and medicines. Um, and her telling us that uh, other than a form of reparation, land back, which is a movement of giving land back to indigenous communities. There's another way of looking at it. It's like, put the land back. Put it back to, to the way it was. Put it back to health. Um, Earl Hatley, a, a friend who uh, is of the Cherokee and Abenaki nations in Vermont now, uh, but from Oklahoma, really driving home the idea that renewable energy and wind will not get us to the just transition, giving us lots of details about the depredations that, are, that have been done through mining and extraction on indigenous lands um, in this country and elsewhere, um, saying, you know, we can't mine our way out of it. It isn't all about renewable energy. And, and then it, it'll all be fine. So with that, I will just close with my own rededication to working with all of you to build that social mycelium. And my current focus really is to work on ways to share the land, to repopulate the rural countryside and offer refuge to those who need it, and are willing to collaborate in building food and health sovereignty. That we have to be all be evolutionary culture builders, and I would love to talk a bit more about uh, some of the people, other people I've been working with, and the teachings that I have been privileged to be receiving um, from my my own teacher through the network that we call Community Supported Enlightenment. But I think it's time to end my piece and hand it over to Molly, and then we'll be able to have some questions and discussion. And thank you all for coming. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, my name is Molly Wills, and I work as the grassroots organizing director with Rural Vermont, which is a farmer and farm worker led organization that's been around for almost 40 years, um, working on justice and inequity in the food system and the greater world. Uh, and a lot of the work that we do is really focused on food sovereignty. And a beautiful thing about being the last person on this panel is so many of my sweet, cool friends have already said the really important things um, for all of us to hear linking this work with climate resiliency and um, how we can forge a livable future for all of us. Um, I'm just going to read a short, a short definition about agroecology and food sovereignty. 
because they're really wonky words that we throw around a lot and it's really easy um, to leave ourselves behind and our friends in the process um, when we don't know what we're talking about. So these definitions were co-created by um, friends and comrades that are part of La Via Campesina, many of whom you all met earlier this week. And they're short, I promise. Uh, agroecology is the systematization of ancestral, indigenous, peasant, farm worker, and migrant ecological knowledge applied to food and farming systems. So agroecology is the basis for food sovereignty. And that is the right of peoples to collectively build and defend their own food systems based on ecology, culture, and social justice. So those are really important, right? And we've, we've heard a lot about some really amazing work that's happening in different parts of the country and internationally and why this is a really key component to mitigating climate change, helping us have a livable future, and also from a harm reduction lens of what do we need to change now to meet people's basic needs. And I think what I would like to do is take a, a holistic lens when we're talking about this um, because there's a whole host of really dire environmental crises that we're facing um, in lieu of climate change or with climate change. Like we've heard about many of them. Um, Katie and Maddie were talking about the contamination of our soils with plastics, which is a really huge deal. That goes with water too. Um, water access and rights all around are a um, dire situation for many people around the globe. Um, desertification of our soils, huge climate catastrophes, um, a lot of arable farmland burning, we can go on, right? And then on the other side of things, we have a number of um, social equity injustices that are plaguing us every single day. And so this is long-standing systemic racial injustice throughout every aspect of our society. This is voter suppression. This is losing rights every day for people with uteruses. We can, we are, we are in this struggle together, and Grace, you use the, I always think about it like a bowl of spaghetti or something where everything's all wrapped together and you pull one end or pick up sticks or something and it's gonna mess with everything else. Um, these things are so incredibly intertwined. And we can count carbon credits every single day to we're blue in the face and we're not gonna solve the problem. Because Maddie, you were talking about it. I don't know where she went. But yeah, you can't ask someone to, be, to try to be adaptable and resilient and to compost their food waste when basic needs aren't being met, when there's not access to health care, when there's not access to child care, or you don't have livable housing or enough food to eat. It's like the human basics. And so Grace, you were talking about how agroecology and food sovereignty, how those are different from terms like regenerative agriculture or climate smart solutions or some of these greenwash terms that Katie mentioned. And it's that social component, right? It's because we're factoring in community care in every step of the process. And that goes from where our seed supply comes from to production methods, processing, distribution, who's ending up with the food and are they able to access it? And do they know what to do with it if they are? Mm -hmm. And so every single step in the process, we have to be having this lens of community care and mutual aid and education. So I think everyone who's part of the, the eco-socialism conference for the last week has talked about this a lot. And I have a lot to learn from all of you. Um, and just the fact that the intertwined nature of everything that we're dealing with, I think it's really a blessing because we don't want to have a, a victory or a win on one end that's going to have our comrades somewhere else lose ground in their fight. That's not getting us where we need to be. And so a number of you were able to meet some of the delegates from La Via Campesina who we were really honored to be able to host in town for a couple weeks. Um, and. They just really helped hammer home for me this idea of internationalism and how every single decision that I make here in my super local community-centered work is causing ripples and impacting people that I don't know about and I can't see all over the world. And so maybe that's like global trade policies, maybe that's investments. Um, 
the Vermont Pension Investment Fund is the, the entity that invests the retirement savings for folks in the public sector, all the teachers in the state. They're enormous. And in the last year, they've invested $100 million um, of the money for people that live here in this global land grab subsidiary called Nuveen, which has an uh, incredibly violent reputation for theft of indigenous lands um, throughout South and Central America and also in the Southeast as well. And so these are all couched under very greenwash terms of you're investing in farmland, you're investing in a climate stable future. And like you were saying, Katie, it's these multinational corporations that are driving the policies um, at the national, international, and local levels as well. And so when we're thinking about agroecology and food sovereignty, citizen activism is a huge part of that. And whatever that looks like for you, we need it. We need it real bad. And that could be calling up your representative and um, giving them a rash of everything because they're voting wrong or they're pushing forward a policy that's going to be detrimental to you. It could be educating your neighbor and sharing something that you learned that you want to share. It could be learning a really valuable like survival skill, like planting a garden or saving seeds and mentoring someone in your community. And it can absolutely and should be taking the streets and shutting it down because we need to be loud and unified when things aren't working. And remembering who we're up against. I feel like in movement building work, it's really hard, right? Organizing is hard, working together is maybe the hardest thing. And there's so many things that can divide us every single day. And it's just the greatest distraction in the world from like these monolithic corporations which are just barreling forward their agenda and yeah it's um it's the work right and so just remembering who who we're fighting against and and how we can get there and remembering how much we all share uh, we got some work to do for sure but at the end of the day we got so much more collectively at stake than we do um, in difference to each other um, I'm not looking at the time I don't know how long I have Cool. Uh, I would like to talk just a little bit more about La Via Campesina. Um, they are the global movement of international peasant agriculturalists. Some people say they're the largest grassroots movement in the world. They have anywhere from 200 million members to 600 million members, depending on who you ask. Um, and they, are, they have a global presence and are very strong, particularly in South and Central America, um, other places as well. And the North American region is hurting a little bit, y'all. Um, we have this culture of individualism in this country that makes it really easy to put aside ourselves and the tiny little piece of the pie that we've been allowed to get and remember that we're part of this collective whole and we've got something bigger to work together towards. And so really learning from our friends um, down in South and Central America, Mexico and Ecuador and Nicaragua and Chile in particular, uh, about how to do agroecological formation. How do we build a movement that's based on soil health and human health and health of our ecosystem that we all need to survive? And they've got some really good ideas. <laughs> And it's going to look different here. And one of the things that I really love about working with La Via Campesina is they're this global network that has so much experience doing this work, but it's all rooted in, in the earth here. Yeah. It's rooted in the grassroots that we have. Because you can't copy and paste anything. It's just not going to work. Uh, but we can build models, and we can adapt things, and we can support each other through that adaptation and try new things and mess up and experiment and figure out something that does work. And then we can share that with people in other communities that want to do that work there and want to grow that power there, and we can help them and support them do the same thing. And that's how we build a movement. And we all have so, so much to learn from each other and so much to offer. And it doesn't matter if you've got like really technical agroecological skills or um, incredible political education training models and like the popular education model, farmer to farmer stuff or you're really great at baking cookies and you want to just like take the edge off for people that are trying to meet at the end of a long day. Mm -hmm. There's like absolutely room and need for everything. Um, so I think I just want to say that 
by leaning into what's already here and people that have been doing this incredible work for a really long time in Vermont, in the Northeast, in the country, in the world, we already have what we need. We're learning every day, we're adapting every single day, but we got it already, and we just have to figure out how to use it. So thank you all for spending your week together and for being here tonight. This is the tail end of a really, really long experience for a bunch of you, and I appreciate you hanging in there. And um, yeah, I hope that I can just share some of that hope from, from our friends that came and shared so much with us from far away and close to home as well. Because um, it's a really beautiful thing when we can remember that we're all in it together. Well, it's about five after eight, so we have 20 or 30 minutes to uh, hear some responses, some questions, uh, continue the discussion. I'm going to speak very briefly. Um, I'm sorry to say I, I wasn't here to know about how many people have poured their hearts into this event. Um, and it's truly a blessing, I think, to, to Marshall to have people working so much on the front lines together, especially coming from a distance, uh, to uh, share your elder knowledge with us. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, I'm 76 years old. And I spent a lot of time um, working on my land with goats and chickens and gardens and stuff. And what I know also at the same time is at night when the sun goes down, I collect climate data from all over the world. And what I've been seeing in the last four years or so, and like many of you, I've been doing this for 40 years or more, um, is that our time frame is shifting very fast. The time that we have to count on particular areas of our own country to become agriculturally productive is decreasing because the amount of rainfall um, is changing rapidly in places that were agricultural. I'm also noticing very big things going on out in the bigger world where what's going on in the oceans off uh, eastern Siberia or what's going on in the oceans north of parts of Russia um, is vastly changing the composition of our atmosphere. And also that the oceans, which were once our great big bank of heat and took f heat from the surface and brought it down to the bottom of the ocean where it could be cooled and keep us more or less air conditioned, as well as the polar ice cap, which kept us air conditioned. Um, all of these are running out of room to do that. And there's more and more evidence that the oceans are not cooling the air, but they're just basically going to the same temperature as the surrounding air around them is. That what suggests to me something pretty scary, and I don't mean to end anything on this note, but just to say the time frame's shifting, the amount of time that we might have thought if we listened to climate scientists were like maybe 40 to 50 years to make a big change, is something perhaps maybe closer to 5 to 15 years. And what may happen is that parts of the places that, where people are competing with one another, as we said so many times, where we're not in network with each other, are going to really struggle and probably go to violence in order to try and control small amounts of resources that may be falling into the hands of the people who are privileged already. So society building, networking, and connection, and deep respect of all the kinds of things that have been said here already, by Grace and everyone else, is that we are deeply indebted to every single member of our society, whether they voted for Trump or whether they voted for Biden or some independent, greener, progressive candidate. We're all neighbors. We really need the skills that exist in all of the places where they do exist. We need to draw people out and get them to care about each other again and stop, you know, rattling each other's cages. So I appreciate that you're part of that network. Thank you. Yeah, and what Michael is saying is certainly <clears throat> resonant with what we're hearing from even the mainstream of climate science, that the, the time we have left is really very short, and that the kinds of changes that we need uh, need to happen much faster than anybody can imagine. You know, <clears throat> for those of us who've been following climate science 
for decades. Back in the 80s, and I was in the anti-nuclear movement here in New England uh, in the 70s and early 80s, and we were saying these things then, and then we actually had time for a transition at a relatively modest pace. We don't have that anymore. Right. We don't have that anymore. First off, I want to applaud the efforts you're making in, uh, in Jackson. I, I think they really built upon urban agriculture, which 30 years ago I was involved in in Philadelphia. So I think this is a real uh, positive that, that you're doing in Jackson, particularly in Jackson, so I appreciate that. So I mentioned the concept of the Anthropocene. So who has heard of that in this room? Okay, so for those of you who don't, it's the concept that humans have, um, have uh, basically taken over the processes of Earth. And we are so strong now that we can um, dominate every process in, in the Earth. And this is a concept that's really big in academia, it's really big in corporate, uh, corporate boardrooms, and in the digital world. So it's that humans can create the solutions to fix what essentially is a sickness in the, in the uh, environment, in the ecology. So climate change really is a manifestation of some infection <laughs> that the Earth has, and that infection, unfortunately, is humans. And, and their, um, their industrial uh, concept of life. So without, so that, for me, it's a philosophical issue. So in your graph, the lower 20%, everyone in this room, sort of believes that we belong to the Earth, we work in the Earth, that's where we're going to get our sustenance. The top 80% doesn't. <laughs> they believe in creature comfort, they believe in industrial wealth, they believe that um, they are above the processes of the Earth. So how do we go and deal with that philosophical point of view? that? really became um, strong with the industrial age. Um, I, you know, uh, I, sorry, I forgot your name. Katie. Oh, Katie. Katie. Yes. Katie talked about degrowth. I, I'm for all degrowth, but for that top 80%, probably the cure is worse than the disease when you talk about degrowth. How do you talk to people about that? So what does that mean? So who has a smartphone here? Someone hold up a smartphone. So, and this is not to be personal, right? But what does that represent? What does that smartphone represent? Thousands of supply chains. Pardon? Thousands of supply chains. It's, it's extraction, the it's, mineral it's, extraction. Mm -hmm. It's the epitome of the industrial economy. Yeah. Right? So every time we use that, even while we're working in the soil and we're mm -hmm. building soil health, as long as we don't acknowledge that this tool is really a manifestation of the problem, we're not, we're like taking one step back, uh, one step forward and two steps back. Yes. So, uh, not that I'm trying to say that people shouldn't use smartphones. I mean, I have a flip phone. But so the question is, do you think that's a proper perspective? And how do we deal with the issue that for many people, the cure is worse than the disease? I don't concern myself with the silly thoughts of many people. I'll say, I'll say that the problem is definitely capitalism. And for me, well, it's also white supremacy culture and uh, that whole litany that I'm sure y'all are familiar with. But I want to talk about capitalism for a minute because capitalism relies on us consuming. And so I think that first and foremost, we talk to people about the way they consume. Um, I know I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, God, Katie, you're handling plastic. <laughs> we should be anti-plastic <laughs> and the contradictions there. But, I mean, we are going to have a lot of contradictions. And there are going to be people who don't want to hear that things have to change. That's why I think I was trying to make the point that we, who do understand big change has to come, need to be really clear about the language we use. And that's why I was trying to list the build and fight um, 
strategy model because I think it starts with mutual aid. I mean, I think it starts with recognizing that we humans are family and we need to start taking care of each other. And I'll just share my little magical belief that can plant this seed that there's going to be like an evolutionary leap in our ability to have compassion for each other. So we might wake up. I mean, more of us are understanding this. When I look at the eyes of the people I've been meeting the past three weeks, because I was at La Via Campesina, and then I was here at the ISE, it's been amazing and inspirational because it doesn't feel like things are changing. I, I get it, but a lot of things are changing. I think there is a shift in people's um, way they relate to each other. You can see it in the young kids. I've got five myself, and I see it in them. Um, so I'm a perpetual optimist, and I believe that there is going to be just a shift, almost a magical shift, because if it doesn't happen, we do perish. Anybody else? I want to say I appreciate your perspective, Jeff, but I think your reading of the demographics is pretty far off. I don't think anybody in this room is from that global bottom 20% at all or even close. And I think it's really, as the charts from Oxfam illustrate, a very small percentage of the world's population, it might be a little higher percentage here in the US, but a very small proportion of the world's population are the people who are responsible for most of the excess emissions and the excess extraction and the people who are truly benefit, who one could say are truly benefiting from it. Now, a lot of people here in the US have been conditioned through the propaganda system to believe that they too are benefiting and they too have the potential to be part of the global elite. And obviously we need to get through that mindset uh, because those are the people who are being recruited to fascism in this country right now. Um, but uh, I think the overwhelming proportion of people in this community and most communities in this country have the potential to see the benefits for them of transforming to a completely different way. I don't want people to understand something. This life that we live is very simple. We're the only ones that make it complicated. Every lesson we want to learn, and I've said this often, is in the soil. If you look outside, you see a pine tree, uh, what is it, um, a sumac, and some other trees living together, grasses and weeds, flowers and such, living to Together. I don't think you heard me. Living together. Each one has what it needs in order to survive. They're not losing or suffering anything unless we are to fear. Okay? And we don't have the right relationship with the soil. How dare you not respect that which supports you? by taking from it and not putting it back. Have you ever thought about the earthquakes and such and why that is? Because you're extracting from it that which is deep within the earth and it caused the place and such to shift and you have these horrible earthquakes. Okay. It's simple. Everything in the soil has what it needs to support its life. We have the ability to do that ourselves. We should replicate what is done on, on the earth. It's simple. I, I just, it, 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 it makes me sad because we don't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. It's enough for all. There's room here to grow any and everything we need. This earth is a gift to us. And we're not the owners of it. it is, it's a gift. We are stewards of it. And we get what we get when we do what we do. And that's what's going on right now. 
go back to the soil and understand why this is there and that's there. And the benefit of having this here and not there. Why it's set up like that. It's simple. It's so simple. You know, we, we don't have to come up with all these wonderful, wonderful philosophical things. It's there in the soil. Everything we need to know. I, I, I can't, I, <clears throat> I'm a simple woman to see simple things. And I rejoice in the simplicity of life. I respect it. I will that we do the same. And stop playing around with this. Because guess what? The earth is going to do what it needs to do in order to get back to balance. And if we don't, be careful. We'll be in the undertone. We're going to get turned over. It's going to be upside down. Okay? When we don't obey the rhythm of the earth and that which on top and the girls beneath, we will not be here. And we have our own selves to blame. There has to be balance in everything that we do. Put it back. Put it back. This is not for everyone. What are you afraid of? Okay. I, I, I would that we learn this lesson. This is it. This is it. This is it. We messed this up. That's it. And then the next generation of people will be born and created to populate the earth, hopefully to do the right thing this time. Mm -hmm. That's for real. That's the reality. Returning to like draft animals, more of a uh, subject when we talk about alternative transportation. Say that again, dear. Sorry, I don't know. Okay, I can't speak. Well, I'm um, Why isn't uh, like draft animals more of a subject that we talk about when we talk about alternative transportation? I can't really speak directly to this, but we did have um, some members of the Draft Animal Power Network out at the Agroecology Encounter a couple weeks ago. And some of the things that they shared uh, when asked about is it more um, economically efficient to run a tractor than to plow your fields with draft animal power. Um, if you factor in human labor, then it's actually pretty neck and neck as far as the, the fossil fuel inputs that we have to have. And so, honestly, when I think about it, is it might be more of an infrastructure issue. Um, we're set up in Vermont, our roads are so good, huh? Um, they treat our cars so well. And I think, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. And we have to just think about the land base that it would cost to feed animals like that. And what's that land currently being used to produce, if anything? And um, yeah, it would be like a radical transformation of, of how we're using uh, the landscape, I think. I like it. Ask the animal if they want to get a track. I'm joking, but I'm so serious. Okay. Okay, I'll try to this question. So, I'm kind of curious about this question. So, first of all, thank you all so much. You all are. You asked about that camera. Yeah, just don't go that camera. If you can hear me, just don't. Yeah, thank you all so much. You all are amazing. I'm curious. I imagine really quickly people seizing land in Detroit. I'm curious if you have any more details on that. We talk about, I think there's a lot of different ways to obtain land. We talk about one of them is community land trusts, which are seem really awesome to me. But I'm really curious about just different strategies for obtaining land, like particularly money's tight <laughs> and land is very vacant. So yeah, seizing land, slotting, I don't know, organizations like what MST does in Brazil or like what the Tapatistas have done. Just like, I guess, what are your thoughts on seizing land and the viability of it? And like, any thoughts on that? Well, 
Corporation Jackson doesn't necessarily seize land. We acquire it as we can. And the, the, there is an intent behind it. And that is so that the people have places to live. Otherwise, businesses will encroach on natural spaces for people to live. Um, and it, and it, it happens. I've noticed since a child that areas become run down, if you will, okay? And they're run down to the point where my folks couldn't afford to buy it, but other people could, and they can buy, ma they can buy masses of land and turn it into an area where I can't live anymore. I had an issue with um, a university. Um, I was uh, president of ACORN there for that period of time. And what was coming down the pipe was uh, this legislation of uh, quick take. And what, what was going on was they were taking the, taking the land from the people, the government was taking land from the people and turn it into investment property or, or in other industries, right? But it went so far to come into the neighborhoods. But they were using the president of the, of the university to, de to, to clear out the neighborhood. And his argument was, well, we're going to clear it out and make it better and you come back in and, no, dude, because most of these people haven't had a mortgage in 30 years. Many of these people are elders. You want to tear down their house so they cannot live back in it but have to go somewhere off to the other side of town that's even less desirable than where they are. And this is what has happened. Many people were displaced. They were going and they buying up people's houses for taxes and displacing whole communities. There went the history and the culture of that place. You know, we would do that. Not too far from the university, let me say it, Jackson State University, um, Richard Wright, which is one of our most famous black writers. He stays in that, and his house was supposed to, there was supposed to be a marker there, or they at least should have preserved his house. That was his home. But they just mowed it down and turned it into a, what you call them, circle rounds? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? And you would never know he'd been there, and that's part of our history that's been lost because you displace people for business. This is what we're trying to stop. Community land trust is set up to protect that. So that, that's, that is what we're doing, that is our intent. It's, it's protection and that we have the right to live where we live. There's a lot going on in terms of setting up different forms of land trusts, land alliances, um, and reparations and all kinds of things like that. There's another project that I hear about every other day of another group that's um, trying to secure land for people who have been dispossessed over, the, over time and making access for, for people who are marginalized in one way or another. Um, but it's but at the root of it all is the, is the ridiculous idea that people can own land, and that's one of the, the cultural baked-in assumptions that has to be overturned. And uh, the community land trust model is one way that that it begins to remove that concept that. It, it is really the community that owns the land, and people have rights to use it for their safety, comfort, security, to self-provision, to grow food for the community, but uh, it is not, does not belong to any individual. Uh, and there's a whole history of, of the commons and movements to recommon uh, property, and that's where we are really aiming at. I completely agree in the specific cases you asked about. In Detroit, at the height of employment in the auto industry, it was a city of three or four million people. Now it's a city of three quarters of a million people. So there's a lot of abandoned land 
that people have figured out various ways to, uh, to get control of as communities and neighborhoods. Um, the Brazilian example you raised is one of the best in the world, the Landless Workers Movement, the MST. Uh, some of our friends from the Vermont Workers Center have been invited uh, every year to participate in the MST's movement school in the city, outside of the city of Sao Paulo. So we have some direct experiences of, of the MST uh, from right here in our community. Um, Brazil has one of the most unequal patterns of land ownership in the world. And people, communities of people, have been organizing to take back that land. It's been happening since uh, ever since the end of the military dictatorship in the 1980s. And that's a movement with hundreds of thousands of members. Uh, let's hear from Russell, and then uh, it will be probably time to wrap up. Uh, I was just going to say, also our, our friends in Mexico, we have the legacy of Emiliano Zapata to look to um, when it comes to agrarian land reform on the tail end of the Mexican Revolution. And um, that movement was able to transition a lot of land into the ajito, or collective land ownership model, that is still prevalent um, today. And just to put a name on what Grace was talking about, if you don't know about the Every Time Project in Vermont, check it out. They're super cool. Um, everyone should support their work. Russell, Russell, last word. Yeah, so um, I agree with what you were saying about the land in Brazil and the disproportionate um, rates that specifically um, people of color have ownership or even access to. And those ratios are very close to Vermont. Hmm. How white people in Vermont have super large swaths of land, and the very small percentages of people of color, indigenous folk, and folk who come here to try to live um, have very little opportunities. And even historically, there is a kind of, and, and, and if folks can address this, there's a kind of redlining in Vermont that exists. Um, but it exists under the guise of, for lack of better terms, keeping Vermont Vermont, um, not allowing people to build. Um, and that is actually something that needs to be addressed. And the sheets need to be pulled off of it in the context of people constantly saying that um, we're trying to preserve preserve the pristine uh, uh, parts of Vermont, which can be done, and building also still can happen. And, and when I say building, I don't mean just green building, but building that has uh, ties all the way back to indigenous folks in their style of building. So those styles of building are um, uh, 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 put forth. Do you think that we can get white folks in Vermont to support those ideas, but also to uh, uh, share the land. Yes. And if they don't, what some of your strategies from that, and specifically folks from Vermont, uh, on how that would look, and what would be a good strategy to get people to share the land? <laughs> I, I certainly don't have the answers to that, but because I'm holding the mic, um, I'm going to bring it right back to every town and sort of the, what I think is a really beautiful that works with that project. And so if there's the, every town is the um, Vermont arm of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. And there is sort of an accompanying every town neighbors project, which is mostly made up of allies. And that is an emerging group. But the idea is that it's going to be super strong and statewide and doing some of the community mutual aid education work to ensure that our communities are safe and welcoming to folks of color, both people that are already here and also factoring in that Vermont is one of the safest places to be um, in the climate crisis and that there's going to be a huge migration of climate refugees. And so folks need land, they need to be in a safe community, and they also need access to infrastructure. And there's a group of volunteer carpenters called Just Construction, which has worked locally and regionally with a number of folks here that help um, provide some of that 
infrastructure to make it actually more accessible and to, to provide some of those missing pieces. And so that's like a really super tiny thing, but just thinking about what do we all have to bring to the table and how can we work together to support these efforts that are happening to make them more encompassing of what we need. Because you're right, Russ, we need a huge amount of education. Uh, we need a huge amount of land transfer. We need to have some hard conversations about what's going to happen with a large amount of agricultural land that's currently in the dairy industry with the average age of the farmer being 65 years old and what's, what's going to happen to that. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity and there's also a lot of work to be done to ensure that that's not just going to end up in the hands of second and third homeowning white people. I think that says it. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't add anything. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. This has been a terrific conversation.